We're talking with Dr. Kenneth Fader uh, about uh, ancient archaeology, uh, pseudoscience uh, in archaeology, anthropology, and history. And it pops up a lot. You know, we, we talk about uh, some of the theories on, on this program. I'll tell you, if you add the word lost to almost any noun, it becomes infinitely more interesting, at least for me. It works. Uh, you know, lost city, lost civilization, lost tribe, lost treasure. Man, that grabs me. That stuff grabs me. Anything that's lost. The question is, uh, is it lost? Uh, did it really exist at all? When you talk about places like Atlantis, uh, that that becomes a, a pretty key question. And we're going to jump into that. Return to ancient aliens as well and uh, talk about geoglyphs and as much as we can in this next segment of Coast to Coast AM. Dr. Fader, uh, earlier this year, there was an article. It was reprinted in various uh, versions in different publications, and I'm sure you saw it. It, it asked the question, uh, sort of posed it, in light of the popularity of the ancient uh, astronaut uh, TV stuff, that uh, whether ancient civilizations could have existed before the ones that we know of, given the age of the Earth. That was kind of, sort of a, um, a fun exercise. Is it possible uh, did did you read those articles, and what did you did it stimulate conversation in your classes? Uh, no, I actually didn't. Do, uh, did not read the specific one you're talking about. But this this is the kind of stuff that crops up every now and again. Um, but you know, there, it's it's these are things that are fun to think about, fun to yeah. imagine. But you know, with as, as an archaeologist, it, it all rests on the bedrock of reality is is the the most important um, thing in assessing the the validity of those kinds of claims. And I, I don't. I never have liked the, those kinds of. Well, but isn't it possible? Well, yeah, everything's right. possible, sure. But the bottom line here is: is there any evidence for it? Is there anything that supports those kinds of claims? And the answer is: is in general, no. Although in specific instances, yeah, we're surprised. Uh, Gobekli Tepe is an example of where. Wow, we were surprised that it was that that particular site has um, sculptural work. And architectural work that are that are pretty damn advanced for the age of that site, um, and so that's great when that happens. We embrace that and we incorporate it into our models of of antiquity. Um, but if we're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, even millions of years ago, and I've heard claims about sites that are supposed to be millions of years old that reflect some ancient, um, extraordinarily advanced civilization, and uh, well, the evidence is lacking. Yeah, I think the the premise of the article that I read, uh, the the premise of the article I read was given the age of the Earth, um, if such a civilization existed even a million years ago, would there be any evidence left to evaluate? And maybe the answer is no. So I, you know, it's, it's kind of a circular uh, argument. It's just fun to kick around, and I think yeah, it was probably sure. created to generate conversation. Right. I mean, that's that's fine. But you know, it's it's kind of um, like the argument about ESP that. Well, yeah, but it, it's there, but if a scientist tries to look for it, it disappears. It, it's the shyness effect. Well, that means it's not testable. So if, you're, if anybody says, well, there, maybe there were these societies, but there will ne- we'll never find any evidence of them, then, there, then that's, that's kind of a – from my perspective, it's fun, but it's a meaningless exercise because by definition, you just told me, well, we'll never find evidence for it. Archaeology is a whole bad evidence. So, well, I, I tell you what, we could uh, we could spend the next half hour talking about evidence for ESP. I don't think that's where you want to go, but no, I'm no, I'm going to no, tell no, you no. what I'm going to send you I'm going to send you some material because I have a feeling that that maybe you've touched on this but haven't really dove into the deep end of the pool. But I'm happy to send you some stuff if you want to read it because uh, oh, sure. there Absolutely. are some scientists who have have explored some interesting things right. along those lines. Um, let me ask you this uh, about Atlantis. I, I'll, I'll give you a, a sort of a a laundry list, and we'll go down and cross some of them off here. You, you know, Plato, there have been a variety of stories about Atlantis. Is there any evidence at all? And and have any of your colleagues taken sort of a, an actual hard look at at diving into it and trying to find it? Um, you know, there's a, there's a yes and a no to that. Uh, the, the answer is Atlantis, as described in detail, by Plato in two of his dialogues, Timaeus and Critias. No, that doesn't exist. There's no evidence for it. However, then, then the question is, well, was he inspired by some actual historical civilization, by some historical event, and did he take those, those ideas and incorporate that, those real things into his fictional story, which, and his intention being to, to, tell, to tell 
a story to, to, to make a particular point about how a society should be ruled. And that question, I, I'm not sure that there's any one particular um, uh, historical event or civilization that inspired Plato, but there, some of my colleagues have, for example, pointed to Minoan Crete and say it was the, the, um, the explosion of the Santorini, the, the, the fear of volcano that had a huge impact on Minoan Crete, um, destroyed some of Minoan Crete, and that maybe that story was passed down. Plato heard about it and said, oh, I'm going to use that. And writers, you know, writers of fiction do that all of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, that, so that, that wouldn't be surprising. I'm not sure that the, the case has been made, though. Um, but, the, but the Atlantis of Plato, the, the, the details of where it was and how big it was um, and how old it is, none of that stuff has, has been borne out by evidence. I, I guess there's nothing, not a lot to study. So would, can you, there's no such thing as a, a paper in an archaeological or anthropological journal, is there, about Atlantis or trying to find it or somebody oh, who sure, spent no, time no. digging into it? The, the people have been writing about this stuff for decades. Again, trying, for the most part, trying to pinpoint a source for Plato's story. You know, what, was, what could have inspired him? I see. Um, and, Tell and me there this. Are whole uh, books, there are whole books dedicated to that as well. Um, pyramids. Uh, pyramids. Why? So they're in Egypt. They're in Central America. Uh-huh. They're in China. They're in Bosnia. Um, what do you make of that? Is that just a spontaneous uh, inspiration? Well, the, the Bosnian pyramids turn out, by the estimation of most geologists who've looked at it, to be actually just mountains that are pyramidal. Ah. <laughs> and I've seen those in Utah. I've seen, I've seen mountains in Utah that, at, you know, from one angle, my gosh, they're, they're so straight, they're so flat, they're so triangular, um, and they're entirely natural. But the, the, the deal about pyramids is, look, if you are an ancient society, right, you don't have um, a m- machinery in order to make large structures. You don't have I-beams made of iron to support these structures. If you're going to make something big and tall, you better make it big on the bottom and narrow at the top because that is durable. It will last. And so it's not at all surprising that the, the native people of North America built pyramids of earth, and the, they, are, they are shaped like truncated pyramids, and the people of Mesoamerica did the same, and people in Asia did the same, um, and people, in, of course, in, in Egypt did the same, and people south of Egypt, the Sudan, did the same. Um, and it's, so it's not terribly surprising that people came up with this same solution to, I want to make something gigantic, but I don't want it to fall in on itself. Mm-hmm. Well, you make it big on the bottom and, and narrow at the top, Nothing else really works, and uh, triangular faces are are, are kind of the, um, the 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 default the, the default solution. But even there, you know, the pyramids, of course, of Mesoamerica do not look like the pyramids of Egypt, except for the fact that they're bigger on the bottom than they are on the top, because the pyramids of Mesoamerica are flat top, they're truncated. There are temples on top of them, and there are stairways leading to those tops, and you don't see that in the Egyptian pyramids. Um, what do you make of geoglyphs, uh, like the Nazca lines and, and uh, different figures that are uh, different places around the world, especially in the Southwest? So, uh, aren't they cool? They really are yeah, cool. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, yeah. At, uh, I've never been to Peru. I've seen pictures of those. Of course, I've been to Blythe, California. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah isn't, that a, isn't that a great place? I mean, it's really yes. amazing. Um, in fact, one of I, I'm, I'm going to flog one of my books. I, I wrote a book, which is not about archaeological frauds, but about... It's called Ancient America, 50 Archaeological Sites to See for Yourself, where you can actually visit these places and, and um, appreciate them in person. And there's nothing like that. Blythe, California has these gigantic geoglyphs, these gigantic drawings, um, um, earth drawings. Of uh, Most of them are look humanoid. They're, an- they, they, they're, they're anthropomorphs. They look like people. Um, and a, there's one that looks like a, well, maybe it's a, 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 a mountain lion, and there are some geometric ones. And there again, uh, you know, when you ask ancient people, when you ask modern people whose ancestors made those, well, how come, the answer is usually the same. It's because the gods live up in the sky, and we want these things to be seen by the gods. Um, my gosh, Christian churches are often built in the shape of a cross, which you can't see or appreciate unless you're looking down on them. And the people who built those during the Middle Ages, well, they, didn't have, uh, they didn't have any contraptions to fly up in the air and take a look at it. Well, they don't, it's, not for, it's 
it's not for the benefit of people, it's for the benefit of the gods. Um, and building something on a gigantic scale um, that represents maybe the spirits that you worship, uh, it makes perfect sense within the context of a society that wants to, that has gods and spirits that need to be worshipped. Um, humans and dinosaurs coexisting. I, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this, but I, that still comes up. I mean, yeah, uh, it, it does. Up. Um, years ago in, in Connecticut, we have this wonderful place in Connecticut um, uh, in Rocky Hill. It's the Rocky Hill Dinosaur Park where they're building a road and they uncovered all of these dinosaur footprints. And when they built, when the state built a dome over it and the local paper, the Hartford Current wrote an article about it, they actually got nasty letters from people complaining that how dare you say the dinosaurs died off 65 million years ago. Dinosaurs were alive only a few thousand years ago, and they, humans and dinosaurs walked side by side, and there are footprints in Texas that show this. Um, those footprints in Texas are, some of them were actual fakes made during the Depression, but a lot of them are just these misinterpreted, um, eroded dinosaur footprints. Um, humans and dinosaurs, the, the, the last of the dinosaurs died off 65 million years ago. And if you really push it, the, 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 the oldest of the human ancestors, um, creatures walking around on two feet, maybe we're looking at six or seven million years ago. So there's a almost 60 million year gap between the, the die off of the dinosaurs and the, um, the rise of the hominins, the, the earliest human ancestors. And there, there's no archaeological sites, no paleoanthropological sites, no paleontological sites where we find the bones of dinosaurs in the same stratigraphic levels as the bones of human beings. Uh, Noah's Ark, uh, you write about that in this book, I, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be zeroing in on biblical stuff. I, I raise Noah's Ark because there are archaeologists and expeditions, and I think an ex astronaut or two who have, yes, yes. Uh, ex, who have gone after this, and they think they've identified a place in Turkey. Yeah, well, the, um, there, here again, what we've got are some aerial photographs or satellite photographs of a geological feature that geologists, people who really know rocks, say, oh, yeah, we know that about that. That's, that's a common geological feature, and here's what it is, and here's how it formed. You know, when, when, uh, when somebody brings down pieces of the ark, and it's radiocarbon dated, and it's the right age, and it's the right place, uh, then we can start talking about uh, about an ark. That that absolutely that ignores all of the questions about. Wait a minute, uh, how did koala bears from Australia get on board the ark? How did animals from all over the world and two of every kind and were and you're talking about dinosaurs and people living side by side? Were there dinosaurs on board the ark too? There are people who say, oh yeah, they're but they're small dinosaurs, so they didn't not a big tyrannosaurus rex that would have eaten all the other animals on the ark. Um, the biblical story of the flood in Noah is something that has a long history in the Middle East. It goes back before, in fact, the biblical story. Uh, in Mesopotamia, there is Utnapishtim, um, uh, who is the, effectively Noah. And so the, the writers of the Bible took some of those details, some of the specifics, from earlier Mesopotamian texts. So, and it, it may be that there was a, a tremendous flood um, between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, and to people living there at the time, it might have looked like, oh my gosh, the world is coming to an end, the world is flooding. Um, you know, we've experienced some of that recently with Hurricane Florence, where whole communities are completely decimated by, by flooding. Um, and the story gets told again and again and again, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until the entire world was destroyed by a flood. Um, the archaeological record of the world shows that that simply didn't happen. Um, Stonehenge. You know, you'd figure as much as it's been studied, uh, we'd sort of have that settled. Um, but there's always different uh, different versions, new reports, new ideas about Stonehenge popping up. Um, I, I don't follow it day to day, but certainly year to year, I, I read about it when new articles are published. Well, where, what's your take on Stonehenge? What, my take on Stonehenge, I've actually been there a couple times, and it's one of the most amazing and wonderful places you're, you're ever going to want to see. And of course, I'm biased, right? I'm an archaeologist. I love this stuff. But I think just about anybody who visits there will, it's, it's incredibly moving that 4,600 years ago, um, people who are just like us, but who had no technology, very None of the technological adva advantages, of course, that we have were able to build this, this beautiful, almost alien-looking monument, um, basically, to keep track of the rising of the sun. Um, and what's, what's the cool thing about, about Stonehenge is we do learn more about it all the time. 
And part of that is because of advances in the technologies we apply to studying um, the, uh, the remains. So, for example, we didn't know long ago where the people who were buried near Stonehenge, you know, the assumption was, well, they must be local folk, but it's, only, it's through the, the analysis of their bones now, things like strontium, isotope analysis, where we're able to actually pinpoint, to an extent, where those people actually came from. And we find out that, you know what, these people came from all over Western Europe. So that Stonehenge must have been a, a place that, that even if you lived in Switzerland, if you lived in France, you knew about this place, and some people made pilgrimages there. Um, the most, most recently, they've actually pinpointed where some of the blue stones, these are the, the, the stones in the interior circle, but not the big ones, not the big sarsons or the chilothons, but the, 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 um, these um, hard stones, that come from, we knew they came from Wales, but fairly recently one of the quarries was excavated that was the source for those blue stones. So that's, that's exciting. And, and, and actually, you know, it's only a few years ago that um, in Durrington Walls they found a settlement where people, probably the folks who made Stonehenge or made pilgrimages there and feasted there, um, where they were, uh, and that's been excavated archaeologically. So it's by finding new sites, by applying new technologies, we learn more all the time. But I tell you what, back in the day, some people thought Merlin the Magician built Stonehenge, and yeah. um, to the, we have never found any evidence for that, and I don't think we will in the near future. I'll tell you a story. In 1994, I went over uh, to uh, England in the summertime, uh, a little expedition, and we, a small group of us, got permission to go inside Stonehenge sure. at night, just us, on the stones, and it was a full moon. It was just a once-in-a-lifetime oh, kind of experience. That must have been incredible. Yeah, it's a memory I'll never forget. That's an amazing place. Um, uh, yeah. Let's try one more. Sure. Uh, we'll have about a minute here. The mound builders in North America. Um, you know, I have, I have a, 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 real, a personal connection to the story of the mound builders because it was one of the things that got me interested in archaeology um, seriously or interested when I was in college. When I had never – here in the Northeast, we'd, you know, when I was in high school, um, we had never heard about the mound builder culture, the mound builder civilization of the American Midwest. And it was only in college when I, I elected to do it, write a paper about this place called Cahokia, which I had never heard of before. And then as a grad student, I, was, I had the opportunity to actually go to Cahokia, and I've been there now several times. Um, it's, it, the, 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 the thing that's important about – there's lots of things important about the mound builders. But one of the things is that it, it belies the stereotype that most people have of Native Americans who, who view – Native Americans as well. They live in teepees and they they run. They're nomadic and they they hunt buffalo from horseback. Where the mound builders, the the um, especially the temple mound builders, Cahokia is the most extreme example. Were a civilization and Cahokia was a city on the banks of the um, the Mississippi River, a city of ten thousand or twenty thousand people. Monks Mound, the the great truncated pyramid of earth that dominates. Um, the, the landscape at Cahokia. It's we'll come back. Uh, we're, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Kenneth Bader, uh, talking about mound builders and other archaeological and anthropological mysteries. At the top of this hour, we're joined by W.C. Jameson, treasure hunter, a memoir of his life chasing after gold and silver and uh, all kinds of fortunes. It's a pretty wild ride. For the moment, we're talking with Dr. Kenneth Fader, Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries, Science, and Pseudoscience in Archaeology, is the name of his latest book, and we go to the phones. A lot of folks are on the phone lines already and have questions. Just a little reminder, we are respectful of all viewpoints here, so I know many of you might want to uh, vigorously disagree with Dr. Fader, but we're going, to, uh, we're going to be polite about it and have a cool adult conversation coming up in the next segment. We'll be right back. We're back. Uh, our final segment with Dr. Kenneth Fader, uh, talking about frauds, myths, and mysteries, uh, science and pseudoscience in archaeology. We go to the phone lines. Uh, our first-time caller, Wayne, in Glendale, California. Hi, Wayne. What's on your mind? Hello. This is Wayne. Howdy. Uh, I would like to say that I was in the, at the World's Fair in Australia, Brisbane, 1988, and inside the gate was an eight-foot-tall 18-year-old person, and he was big. And I'm only six foot four, but this guy was definitely eight foot tall. 
and he was proportional to his size, not just tall and skinny like me. The point being, someday somebody's going to dig up Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's uh, and Shaq, uh, Shaquille O'Neal's remains, and they're going to think there's a giant uh, that walks among us. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. Um, Dr. Fader? Yeah. I, when you look at the, the range of variation in human height, I mean, there are some extremely, extremely tall people. You just watch, watch an NBA game, and you know there are a lot of folks over seven feet high, and I think some. I think the tallest man on record was something like eight and a half feet high, uh, feet tall. Um, he had acromegaly, so he that was a, a pituitary condition. But yeah, that happens. That that's a, a again within the range of variation. The folks who are talking about giants in the in the earth, giants walking the ancient Americas. They they're talking about people who are eight feet tall, but they're talking about people who are ten feet tall, twenty feet tall, and thirty feet tall. And so we're talking about another thing entirely. The fact that, yep, there are some really tall people walking around, and there may have been some very tall people in antiquity, absolutely true. But 20 feet tall, 30 feet tall, the, the, the physics and biology just don't support that kind of height. Wayne, thank you for the call. You know, it's occurred to me, uh, Ken, Kenneth, that, uh, you know, if there were ancient aliens or a- alien astronauts and they came to Earth and they go back home and they have to describe what humans look like, They'd have a heck of a time coming up with a generic description. I guess yes, <laughs> um, but well, okay. Uh, it's they would. I bet you they would probably take some photographs to yeah. show to show back home what what it is we look like, because nobody will uh, believe it when they get back home. Yeah, that there are so many different kinds of us. Uh, east of the Rockies, Brian in Indianapolis. Hi, Brian. Hey, George. Good morning. How are you? All right. What's on your mind? Kenneth, how are you doing today? We're all good. Hey, listen, I, I'm a I'm a skeptic, and I, I want to I'm I'm seeking the truth on all this ancient alien stuff and these oh. these uh, these pyramids and stuff uh, that are that are all across the world, mm-hmm. like in South America, in Southeast Asia, and China. Uh, not necessarily the pyramids, but these temples that these ancient civilizations have built. Mm-hmm. How how do you how do you explain the architect as being uh, damn near the same? All in the in the in the distance between these civilizations is so great. How do you explain the um, the like I said the uh, the the uh, God, I lost my words. Uh, there's Just the, the similarities. Same. Yeah, I, yeah, the similarities. Without, without the ancient, the ancient astronaut theorists believe that ancient aliens came down and and gave these this knowledge to these ancient civilizations. Can you explain away? Can you explain that away, or do you agree with it, or do you disagree with it? And 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 what's your you know what's your feeling on that? All right. Here's what you need to do. It's real simple. Right. Go to your your web browser. And uh, in the, your Google box there, type in Khufu's Pyramid. That's K-H-U-F-U. That's the biggest pyramid in Egypt, right? Egypt of the Pharaohs. And then type in um, uh, the, the Temple of the Magician at a site called Ushmal, U-X-M-A-L. That's in Mexico. So those are both pyramids. They don't look anything alike. Because, in fact, if you look at the details of these pyramids – that are all over the world, these structures that are all over the world, there are a lot of, of differences, some great and some small, that show that, you know what, they had their own separate evolutionary developments. That's the other thing, too, is that in each of those places in the world, you can trace back through time the development of that technology. You know, the, the pyramids didn't start off perfect. They, got, they started off pretty cruddy, and they got better and better and better through time. The same is true in, in Mesoamerica. The same is true in Southeast Asia. And that, that, that kind of sequence of trial and error, making mistakes, perfecting it, that's a real human thing that happens. That happens in our technologies all the time. That's not what would happen if ancient aliens landed and gave everybody the blueprints for pyramids. Brian, uh, thank you for the call. One of, uh, one of my uh, listeners sent me an email about it. He said, look, if you pour a pile of sand uh, on the ground, it, it forms into a pyramid shape. That that shape makes sense uh, structurally and naturally, but um, uh, I guess that uh, question will continue. Thanks for the caller. On the wild card line, Joe in Monterey, California. Hey, Joe. 
thank you for accepting my call. Um, it's an interesting conversation. I will be very, I'll try to be as short as I can. I'm one of those complainers, but for good <laughs> reason. Um, a professor, and you are still professing, and it's very good. But your argument, okay, you had just invalidated my entire life, several of my past lives, and <laughs> practically my entire existence. Uh, I am an experiencer, and I am an abductee. I am a very advanced soul. I do past life travel, and most of my friends, because I'm an elitist, are experiences. They come from other worlds. They're in the world now, here. They have incredible experiences. And you have just invalidated all the people who listen to Coast to Coast, most of them. In one way or another. Really? You think it was worth waking up this morning, then, if that's... You're doing well, Professor, and I can't expect anyone of your stature to do less. And I'm happy that you're on, because you're giving all the... You're talking about all the fraudulent cases. And this is wonderful, because what you didn't talk about are other things that are true. And the people that go through these experiences, and I have a lot of clients that I take from to, to their past lives, and we see what goes on. Plus the fact that I vet all my information, mm-hmm. my authorities, and then I go searching online in the physical world to see who's coming up with the same information. So when I go to war and speak the truth, I have a lot of good things behind me and people with authority, true authority. So uh, Joe, do you have a question on, for no. Kenneth? Hmm? Do you have a question for our guest? I don't have – I'm going to quote someone who once called up coast to coast, and he said – and I had to laugh when he said it – I don't have any questions. I only have answers. Thank you for the call. Appreciate it. That's an interesting Yeah, thank you. I, I don't know that, uh, that our guest has invalidated everybody who's ever listened to or been on coast to coast. Oh, I think absolutely. What, Certainly, that wasn't my intention, George, and I don't I think, think it did. I think what he's saying is trying to explain the, the viewpoint of these topics from the mainstream scientist viewpoint is that um, at least this guest says, show me the evidence. And, uh, and I don't think he's saying that you can't, uh, you can't believe the things that you believe or, or should not. Uh, anyway, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if you want to say anything else about that, uh, go ahead. No, I mean, I th- listen, I'm not here to question anybody's personal experience or beliefs. I'm here to talk about the physical, material, archaeological record, what we know about the past. And, and, and that's, uh, if, if I've done that, I'm, I'm a happy guy. Yeah, I think it's useful uh, for people who uh, subscribe to the ancient alien theories and who read this stuff, who follow Von Daniken and, and others, who uh, alternative history scenarios to read the other side, to uh, to check into what other uh, folks who have worked on this uh, have also concluded, because uh, multiple viewpoints is is a healthy thing on any topic. Uh, yeah, Dave absolutely. in Long Island on the wild card line. Hi, Dave. How's it going, gentlemen? Nice it's to good. talk to you. I'm an independent researcher on the stone walls of New York and New England. Cool. And uh, I also have my own YouTube channel. And just recently I did a video about, uh, you know, I read a lot of archaeological reports. I do a tremendous amount of research. I've been doing it for years now. I'm looking at a report right now by William A. Ritchie. Uh, Dr. Bader, you familiar with his work in New York State? Yeah, Bill Ritchie was the state archaeologist of New York for years and years and years and years. That's right, and and most of the current notions about archaeology in New York State are based on, on and he's a very good archaeologist, by the way. Yeah, absolutely, not he to, was. Yeah. Not to denigrate him in any way or anything, but I had to clarify a few things on my channel to my viewers and my subscribers about some of the language that's used in some of his archaeological reports. I'm looking at one right now, as a matter of fact, on the pre-Iroquoian cultures, and I go through it just to clarify it to people who think there is proof or there's facts or anything. But I go through the language in his reports, you know, and I've read many of them. And the language in his reports go like this. Might be, probably, possibly, seems to be, probable, probably, you know, suggests. 
we may suppose this hints at this seems to show so basically what you have here is you have speculation based on educated interpretation which you know i had to clarify that to my audience and i say to my audience there's nothing wrong with that and you know that seems to be you know what i also say but the problem is is that the people out there in the world want to take a lot of this stuff as proof and as a fact and in reality it's not proof and it's not fact it's interpretation based on uh, speculation and you know there is not a lot of stuff known on this stuff and as i said you know i've been researching the stone walls of new york and new england and not only that i've made some significant discoveries recently dr robert shock i don't know what you think about dr robert shock but robert shock said in a recent uh, radio interview that he believed that there was messages in the megalithic constructions around the world and i wish dr robert shock would call me because i found messages hey in dave, the dave of we're going to all right, let's let's let uh, Kenneth uh, comment on on sort of the general topic of those walls and um, and thank you for the call, uh, Doctor Fader. Yeah, look, there are lots and lots of stone walls throughout all of uh, New England and New York, and if you go over to um, Europe, England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, you see those stone walls as well. And they're demarcating people's different pastures or, or fields or property, their property boundaries. And those, those are the people who populated New England in the 16 and 17 and 1800s, and they brought those traditions with them of clearing fields, of clearing fields for pasture, because we have a lot of rocks, a lot of glacial till um, that, that is scattered all across um, the, the, the fields in New England that people were trying to make into farmer fields. Um, there also are, as an archaeologist, again, okay, well, who made these things and when? We have some good historical information. And the, the stone chambers, for example, in Acton, Massachusetts, they, the, the archaeologists excavated one of those chambers to, to determine, well, how old is the chamber? What kind of artifacts are found in the chamber? What they found were 18th century um, objects, objects that date to the 18th century, um, and that this was part of a farming complex. And when you've got... You know, I, I will. I understand we don't have a wayback machine in archaeology. We can't go back in time and actually um, be eyewitnesses to what happened in the past. But we have ways of of testing hypotheses. We we have ways of assessing whether or not the statements we make about the past are can be can be supported by data. And when they're supported by data, um, it's again it's something that we're willing to to. Uh, tweak. We're willing to revise when new data comes across, but when the data converges on a single interpretation that these things are colonial, that's what we're going with. And if somebody proves us wrong, good for them. But until that happens, we're going with where the evidence takes us. Dave, thanks for that call. That was interesting. Uh, east of the Rockies, Ralph in Boston. Hi, Ralph. Good morning. How are you doing tonight? All right. Um, I just wanted to ask your guest if he's ever heard about the... Uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics that were found in the Grand Canyon. And they have a lot of the Grand Canyon blocked off from the public. Um, I guess they don't want to yeah. let it out. You know, it'll just confuse dates and years and all this other stuff. I just want to know if he's, if he's heard about those. Yeah, yeah there are a lot of names uh, for objects in the Grand Canyon that have sort of an Egyptian twist to them. I don't know exactly how that happened, but are you familiar with that, Kenneth? Yeah. Here's the bottom line. I know exactly what the caller is talking about. Back at the turn of the 20th century, there was an article in a local newspaper about the, a lost city that had been found in the Grand Canyon up in a, a cave. And it was supposed to be Egyptian or maybe Tibetan or some combination of the two. Um, the article is full of factual errors. Um, it talks about a person working at the Smithsonian Insti um, Institution. Uh, it, 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 the, the, that name, the person doesn't exist. Um, the name of the Smithsonian is, is presented incorrectly. Um, and then when you look at that, that article was published around about April 1st, and it apparently was, and this, this is a typical thing that happened um, in the 19th and early 20th centuries that newspapers published what essentially were hoaxes 
which they then revealed as as um, April April Fool's Day hoaxes. There's one in Missouri called the the um, the, Barry, the um, underground city of Moberly, Missouri, um, which again was ter- turns out to be entirely a hoax. Um, to the best of my knowledge, you know, there's no Egyptian hieroglyphs in the Grand Canyon, but there was this story of an Egyptian city, a, a lost city, a hidden city, deep in a, a cave in the Grand Canyon. Um, and as far again, as far as I know, the Grand Can- parts of the Grand Canyon that are not accessible to people. They're not accessible because they're dangerous. But you know what? People can float down the Colorado River. People do that all the time. And so there's nothing you can't see, at least from a distance, uh, in the Grand Canyon. And there's, So as far as I know, um, that's not factually accurate. All right. Thanks to all our callers. we got about a minute left, uh, Dr. Fader. Uh, yeah. the, the discussion of ancient aliens... I, if there's anything positive about it, and I, I think there is uh, more than just a little bit positive, it gets people uh, thinking and talking and hopefully reading about uh, history and archaeology and anthropology and 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 anything that gets people reading, I think, is a good thing. Yeah, you know, you know, George. Every once in a while, I'll get somebody who writes me because I've been on, you know, a National Geographic special, or maybe because I'm. I'm here on, on Coast to Coast, and they'll say, you know, Fader, you, you just can't explain how the Egyptians built their pyramids, and, and I watch Ancient Aliens, and they have this great explanation. And what I do is I say, hey, look, before you come to a conclusion, before you make a decision, here are some things you should read. And there's a book by Dieter Arnold called Building in Egypt. Um, there's Bob Breyer and Pierre uh, Houdin, who wrote this, the, 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 the Secrets of the Great Pyramid. And when you read those, you see that, you know what, Egyptologists and archaeologists really do know how a lot of this stuff was done, and there's no need to, to fall back on explanations of aliens or Atlanteans teaching the you know, backward Egyptians how to build pyramids. They, they figured it out on their own, and we pretty much know how they did it. I'm in favor of reading, so I would recommend uh, your yeah, book for folks who are interested in this. It gives a perspective maybe that is not always presented on television. Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries by Kenneth Fader. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fader, for being here. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was, a, it, was, it was a pleasure. Thanks. And coming up, W.C. Jameson, Treasure Hunter, in just a moment. 